You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 118 of the Common Descent Podcast. This episode's topic is trace fossils. Ooh. Trace fossils and the study thereof, ichnology. It's a good word. It's a good word. Or uh, more specifically, paleo ichnology. Which is a better word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting subject because we have mentioned traces and trace fossils and ichnology throughout the run of the podcast. Oh yeah, like a bunch. It comes up in the news, it comes up in discussions, but this will be the first time we are devoting an episode to the general topic, and it is a dense, vast topic. <laughs> Ichnology is the study of traces, that is, evidence of activity of organisms in the environment. Footprints, bite marks... Uh, burrows, things like that. Traces of life. Yeah, so not the actual animal, but some trace, some signal that that animal was there. In this episode, we will discuss what traces are, what counts as traces, what the diversity is, how we study them in the fossil record, and what they tell us about Earth history, life history, what things were doing in the past and how they were changing over time. This is, uh, I'm excited to talk about this subject. It's a, it's a big one, but it's a cool one. I'm looking forward to it because it's, I, we've talked about lots of cool examples, but I still don't know really anything about the overall, the overreaching topic. So I'm excited to learn. Yeah, and we are going to overreach a bunch. <laughs> this episode topic was also requested, as oh. all of our episodes are, this time by Cheryl, Rebecca, Mike, and Miranda. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I think each one of those specific requests was worded differently, but it <laughs> comes down to paleo technology, trace fossils, ignites, etc. So thank you for your requests. Just further evidence for how diverse this topic is. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the episode proper, we have a few announcements. First and foremost, as always, this podcast is brought to you by the support of our patrons. Mm hmm. We have a Patreon where people can subscribe to give us financial support, as well as the emotional support that uh, comes from having so many devoted fans. Both are appreciated. And we like to give something back in the form of lots of goodies, uh, extra content. But also, uh, if you subscribe at a certain level as a new patron, we will shout your name out in gratitude here on the podcast. This episode, we would like to welcome to our Patreon subscribers list... John, Travis, Jeremy, and Daniel. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining us. Hey, if you'd like to be a patron, we put up all sorts of extra cool stuff on Patreon. And hey, we'll say your name on the podcast. Yeah, we just proved it. How about that? In other announcements for people who are interested in additional stuff we do outside of the normal podcast... We can officially announce right right here on this episode, uh, we will be attending Dragon Con this year. Yeah, we will. We have been going to Dragon Con for the last few years. We uh, go on panels as guest experts and we talk about nerdy science stuff. Dragon Con normally is a giant nerd convention that takes place in Atlanta, Will's stomping grounds. Woo! Last year, it was virtual, mm -hmm. uh, which was sad to not get to go, but we were very happy to be part of it virtually. In fact, the videos we were part of are still up on the interwebs. You can find them. This year, Dragon Con is going to be back in person with a bunch of safety precautions in place, and we are planning to attend and be part of some science nerdy discussion panels. I'm so excited. It should be a lot of fun. So if you are also planning to go to Dragon Con, Keep your eyes out for us. We will be releasing more information uh, as the dates get closer about what exactly we're going to be a part of. And uh, we will hopefully be able to record at least one or two of our panels to then release on the podcast as we have done in the past. Stay tuned for more. Speaking of uh, new things. And nerdy things. And nerdy things. Uh, will and I are also on another podcast now. Yeah. Yeah. So our friend Josh, really Will's friend Josh, but uh, he's my friend now too because yeah, I, I met him. Very friendly. 
Josh is part of a group of people who have been putting together a tabletop RPG system that is called Level Up Advanced 5th Edition, which is essentially an advancement of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, the current edition of D&D. And as part of promoting the release of this new system, Josh is running a game, an actual play RPG game with a bunch of players, which includes Will and myself. Yeah, it's been pretty fun so far. So if you want to hear more of us, you can check us out there. Yeah, check it out. It is called Mysteries of the Mornland. And it launches, uh, by the time this episode comes out, it the first couple episodes will be out of this podcast. So if that's your thing, give it a listen. Yeah. And with that, it is time to move on to the main events, the first of which is the news. News! Every episode, we like to go over some recent news from the world of paleontology, evolution, biological sciences, the kinds of stuff we like to keep up to date with. Will... Please deliver us some news. Gladly. My first bit of news is about a small, young cave bear that may have been murdered by an ancient human. Ooh, the plot thickens. Yeah. (laughs) This is research by Dmitry Gemrinov et al., and this is in the Journal of Vesnik Archaeology, Anthropology, and Ethnography. And the article we'll be linking to is from Gizmodo by Isaac Schultz which will be linked in the blog post. Hey, there's a blog post after each episode with additional links, including the news. Convenient. Now, this is a bit of research that's a very exciting title. Uh, Stabbed cave bear. Yeah, this is potentially the first evidence of humans hunting small cave bears. Which is pretty cool. Which is pretty cool. Uh, And so what the authors are presenting is a small cave bear skull, from what seems to be like a 9 to 10 year old bear, like age-wise, uh, right, individual right. age-wise, from the Pleistocene of Russia, so about 35,000 years old when they dated the skull, mm-hmm. with a hole toward the back of the skull, a long gash in the skull. Right. A hole where you don't want a hole to be yeah, in your a, head. A one too many holes <laughs> that they are presenting as evidence as uh, of human damage. Ah. potentially hunting right this is the kind we, we've talked about these kinds of discoveries uh on the podcast every now and then and th- these are interesting because they're always you, you can almost always bet someone out there disagrees instantly with evidence of human hunting or human butchery there's all there's always a lot of discussion about what are the alternatives and are we sure that push and pull between dramatic story and cautious inference absolutely and the authors in in the interviews for the article do acknowledge that there is not just one single answer to this hole Mm -hmm. it could be artificial human caused but there are natural answers to what could cause a hole like this a rock can fall on your head a deer can kick you or something. Or if your skull, if you died in the cave and your skull was left it exposed, dripping water could have damaged the bone. True, true. You know, it worn it down over time. But the authors feel that those are less likely than a human-caused injury, partially due to the shape of the hole and the fact that there are flint, stone flint material in the same layers as the bear. And this whole shape matches the cross-section of what you would expect from one of those flints. Gotcha. And I don't have any more details than that if they actually have measured or done detailed analysis, but it to these researchers, it looks like a stab wound from a stone, stone weapon. Gotcha. Which, it sounds like, if true, would be significant. Yes. Now, once again, whether this is hunting, if it is human-caused, it could be hunting, or it could be post-mortem, after the bear died. Right, we discussed in episode 84 with our friend Laura that it can be very difficult to tell if damage to bones happened, if damage to bones happened long before, long after, or near or during death. Exactly. If it was before, that means they killed this bear. To stab a bear in the head. If it was after it was dead, it could be for ritualistic purposes. Okay. Which is something we know Paleolithic humans of this time did practice. So it could be some ritual, some sacrificial, some religious purpose Mm -hmm. for the skull, which is potentially likely because there do not seem to be any other markings for removing meat from the bones, any carving. Gotcha. 
Now, part of the reason this is such an exciting find, if it is evidence of human killing bear, is because of how rare this is among cave bear bones. So cave bear bones in Europe are well known from many areas. There are millions of cave bear specimens, it seems like. From the article, it said of those millions, only about 20 to 30 show signs of human markings of removing meat. Okay. So it's not super common, though it does seem ancient people did feed on bear meat at time. But there's evidently only one example of definite evidence of hunting, which is a stone tip lodged in the vertebrae of a cave bear. Gotcha. That it, it was stabbed by this stone. Yeah. None of these fall in Russia, so this would be the first one from Russia, and all of those with the those markings are on larger, more adult cave bears. So this would also be the first one on a small cave bear. Okay. So that's part of the reason it's so exciting and getting so much attention is if it is a human hunting incident on a bear, it'd be the first one from Russia and from a small bear, at least to, from what the article's saying. Yeah, yeah. That is, it's it's very interesting to have potential evidence of something like that. Mm-hmm. I'll be very curious to see if this gets discussed further, either academically, you know, in, in the scientific literature, or just in ar- archaeology circles. I'll be curious to see. The, the, these kinds of discoveries, you... We always want to be a bit cautious. Oh, yeah. And and there are admitted unknowns. Like, yeah. they acknowledge, we don't know whether this happened pre- or post-mortem. Mm-hmm. We'll need to do further studies to try to determine that. Uh, so that they are acknowledging there are a number of a- questions that need to be answered still. Yeah, but probably a case worth looking into. Yeah. So. Interesting stuff. Well, my first bit of news has nothing at all to do with that. Nice segue. Uh, This is research about dinosaurs. (laughs) Uh, Specifically, miniature dinosaurs and why they became miniature. Ooh. Yeah, this is research by Zichuan Chin et al. in the journal Current Biology, and we will link to a press release in SciTech Daily via the University of Bristol. The dinosaurs in question are a group called the Alvarezsaurs. These are a group of theropods, so bipedal, two-legged dinosaurs, not too far off from tyrannosaurs, oviraptorosaurs, birds, things like that. This group is known with feathers. These were predators from the late Jurassic through the late Cretaceous. They have been found in Asia. They've been found in South America. They're this odd, not particularly popular group of theropod dinosaurs who notably shrink in the late Cretaceous. They got very small in the late Cretaceous, which is interesting because that makes them one of only two groups of dinosaurs, according to the researchers, that underwent miniaturization. And not due to island sort of stuff, just as a group? In terms of their evolutionary trajectory as a group, Whereas other groups had smaller and larger members, many dinosaur groups we see getting larger and larger over time. This is a group that, on the whole, on average, got smaller later on. I immediately assumed we were going to be talking about some dinosaur stuck on an island. No, no. Not like an individual lineage. The whole group. Oh, now I'm so much more interested. Got small. The only other group of dinosaurs that we know this happened in was birds. Yeah. Who, the question of why would they get small is nice and clear. Gravity. Yeah, <laughs> gravity. <laughs> oh, interesting. So this study did an analysis of Alvarez sores over time, focusing on adults who are at full size to get an accurate uh, uh, overview of the adult size of these animals. And then compared all the alvarosaurs and saw, looked at what they were doing over time. And what they found is that for the first 70 million years or so of alvarosaur evolution, they were pretty big with body masses ranging from 10 kilograms up to 50 kilograms, which as the article described, I believe that is the size of a large turkey to the size of a small ostrich. Okay. On average, 30 to 40 kilograms. So about 80 to 100 pounds or so, with at least one species that was giant and got up to 70 kilograms. 
which is you know over 150 pounds that's get getting to us you know adult human men sized and then during the early cretaceous over the span of about 35 million years from 110 to 85 the group shrunk until after the shrinking <laughs> in their evolutionary history they were an average of less than 5 kilograms to so under 12 or so pounds with the smallest ones being less than half a kilogram these so less this, than a pound these are dinosaurs under a shrinking trend on their way to the quantum world <laughs> so these went from being 30 to 40 kilograms on average to being less than five kilograms on average a dramatic shrinkage and like that's because when you said them shrinking and then you said your first size groups, I was like, all right, well, that's what I was assuming we were going to end at. No, no. no they started at itty wolf, bitty. wolf size, like coyote to wolf sized and ended up house cat sized. Whew. Very small. Which, of course, raises the question of why? What were you doing? They weren't flying. Why else would you do it? Well, the authors point out that this shrinking period in their evolutionary history was also, at the time, of the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution, which saw the radiation of flowering plants, episode 57, the origination of modern-style forests and woodlands. And at this point, you might be thinking, all right, but what does, why would they shrink for plants? The answer is, they probably didn't. But with the radiation of plants came the radiation and diversity of ants and termites. Uh... These dinosaurs were shrinking around the same time that ants and termites were radiating and diversifying. In addition to that, the authors point out that there have been studies of the morphology of alvarezsaurs that have pointed out that they have a few weird features. Their jaws are relatively weak, their teeth are simple and often, you know, smaller or lost, and there have been some suggestions that their arms might have been used for digging, which people, uh, other researchers have been like, oh yeah, but they don't look like burrowers. But digging is a common habit if you're digging into anthills or termite mounds and stuff like that. They also point out that among modern ant-eating animals, which are mammals, typically, not always, but typically they tend to be very small. Mm -hmm. So we don't know for sure but there do seem to be a handful of lines of evidence that suggest, uh, first of all, for sure, these dinosaurs dramatically shrunk as a group. And maybe they did it because they changed their diet and became ant-eating dinosaurs. That's so awesome. My most burning question is I want to know how long their tongue was. How were. long was your tongue? Was it anchored to the back of your tail? Right? Oh, <laughs> Pangolinosaurus. <laughs> this is so cool. Because, yeah, on the surface of it, why would a group of dinosaurs get small as an evolutionary overall trend? Right. Why would any group of animals do that? Yeah, like what's causing that... Uh, Lineages make perfect sense because it's all right. Wh where do you live? Do yeah. you live somewhere? This genus, this yes. species, got really small because we lived in this area or on this island or around right. things that took the place of the size category we were living in. Sure, it makes perfect sense, and it even makes sense to have like a mass extinction took out the biggest ones, and you never quite got back up to that size, like happened with ichthyosaurs we discussed in one sixteen. Yes, absolutely. But for your whole group to go that way, it does seem kind of like it, on the when asked with no other information, I have no guesses to offer. Like, I had no idea where we were going to go. Yeah, that is such a fascinating suggestion. And not only I forgot to mention this, not only did the group on average get smaller, but in the late Cretaceous, there seems to have been a radiation of small forms. Hey, that it's not like they only you know, all that was left was the smallest forms. Yeah, they didn't bottleneck to tiny ones. The small forms were diversifying and and, and radiating and evolving new species and new diversity. Yeah, doing they were just well. all small. Fantastic. Very cool. Well, speaking of interesting paleo diets, Ooh. my next bit of news is about research that may have figured out what 
the giant koala lemur was eating. Giant koala lemur? Right. Tell me more about the giant koala lemur. Oh, very well. This is research by Stephanie Marciniak et al. in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the article we'll be linking to is by Mindy Weisberger in Live Science. Koala lemurs were a giant species of lemur from Madagascar. Naturally, episode 40. Also episode 7. Also episode 96. (laughs) 96 was marsupials, which are for koalas. This is not a marsupial. (laughs) It is not. It's It's called a koala lemur because it had a very similar body shape with long arms, short legs, and graspy, big, clingy feet. Well, I assume they don't have eucalyptus in Madagascar. No, they do not. And there's no indication that these lemurs had pouches. Mm. And when we say giant lemurs, we are referring to a lemur that could grow up to about five feet or a meter and a half long, which is the size of some people. True. And weighed up to 187 pounds or 85 kilograms. The size of people. Yeah. All right. (laughs) So this is... That's a pretty big lemur. A person-sized lemur. And this was not the only giant lemur that lived on Madagascar. There was uh, at least 17 different species of giant lemurs. Yeah. This was one of the biggest. Weren't though. there are sloth lemurs and gorilla mm-hmm. lemurs Yep, are also names in my brain that I think refer to large lemurs? Exactly. So Madagascar used to have a variety of large lemurs, koala lemurs being one of the larger of the variety. But most of these big lemurs went extinct between 2,000 to 500 years ago. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. 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 That's, mm, that's a, uh, yep. That we were there. Yeah, we were. <laughs> this research though, in particular is on a jawbone of a koala lemur that is 1,475 years old. All right. Whenever we talk about stuff this young, I have to stop myself from saying million after. Yes. I have, I, that's what the odd pause is. <laughs> yep. 1,475 years. Years. Years old. Yep. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> we said all the numbers. And the reason this research is pretty awesome is, as we've mentioned, things like genetic material usually does not preserve well in the tropics. True. But this <gasps> jawbone did. Oh, goody. So this is DNA research from this koala lemur jaw, and it is well preserved enough that they were able to get nuclear genomic DNA. Ooh, chromosomal DNA. Yeah. So that means they get DNA from both parents. Instead of gotcha, just the true. mother lineage, if you use mitochondrial. Gotcha, gotcha. Episode 34, Ancient DNA. Which makes it ideal for figuring out where this lemur might fall on the lemur family tree. Very handy. So they ran an analysis. They compared this genetic material to modern lemurs, including two species that occupy notably different branches of the lemur tree, the lemur family tree, the red-fronted and the weasel lemurs. And part of the reason that these are worthwhile noting is previously anatomical evidence and research suggested that koala lemurs were more more closely related to weasel lemurs. Okay. This genetic evidence places them with the red-fronted lemurs, or uh, much closer to them. So they are the temistema, the, the false gharial of lemurs. Yeah. And they think that maybe the reason for this confusion is that the similarity in their anatomy was a similarity in diet. Gotcha. Not relation. They were adapted for the same food habits. Yes. Oh. Which leads us to the next bit of their genetic study, which was to look at what they might have been eating by looking at their DNA. So they did an analysis comparing it to 47 animals that were not lemurs, and they found similar protein encoding genes you know so genes to make certain proteins that are reminiscent or comparable to ones they found in the golden snub nose colubine monkeys and horses huh which are genes that help those animals absorb nutrients and break down leafy plant toxins huh which may mean that the koala lemur was a leaf eater browsing on leaves that it may have had to detoxify Oh, specifically eating poison plants. Yeah. Now, they didn't specify what kind of plants, so I don't know how much this defines it being toxic plants or just leaves for sure. They mostly focus on them being leaf eaters, so I don't know gotcha. how how much we can narrow it in. But yeah, the DNA might have told us what they ate. Weird. Right? What a cool time to be in science. <laughs> 
I wonder how much we know about the uh, plants of Madagascar at that time. I wonder if there are ways for us to to go deeper and see if we can figure out, are there habits or proteins related to specific groups of plants? Yeah. That would be very cool. Well, because, you know, so often when we're talking about uh, diets, we're looking at evidence on the teeth or, or chemical evidence. And often it's very broad. Yes. Uh, and I'm not an expert in that field, so I don't know if, you know, I just am not aware of ways for us to get more specific in diets. But it would seem to me that if you can find genetic clues, that maybe your genetic evidence of the proteins you developed as an animal to counteract the proteins a plant developed as a plant might be much more specific two particular types of plants yeah you might be able to sync up your proteins and yeah. figure out where you, where the matches are oh that would be pretty cool that's a question for Allie. yeah or leah oh yeah one of our our plant or dna friends yes oh we need <laughs> we need a tag team duel that's yeah that's right <laughs> also uh just as a side note lemurs just keep stealing names off of other animals huh yeah weasels sloths koalas gorillas it's, I feel like... Find your own identity, lemurs. Even though they aren't marsupials, they're one of the... <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, they're they one are. of the weird primates. And so they fall into that category of everyone's like, I mean, it's kind of like this normal mammal that we could compare it to, which We've, is very rude. We already used up all of our creativity <laughs> naming the other animals. <laughs> We ran out. They go, listen, I can't come up with a name better. That thing is an ant lion. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> well, my last bit of news for this news section involves the word mega tsunami. All right, well, I'm sold. This is research by Gary Kinsland et al. in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. And we will link to an article in Science Magazine by Akila Raghavan at the end of the Cretaceous. As so many stories begin. What happened? Thing, it was bad. It was a bad time. In episode five of this podcast, we discussed the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. And we discussed the space rock that hit the Earth around that time. Right. Landed in the Yucatan, caused all sorts of devastating effects in the atmosphere, in the ecology, ecosphere. But one of the things that it is suspected, and in fact there is evidence that happened after the giant space rock hit, well, our uh, home giant space rock, Mm -hmm. were mega tsunamis. Yeah, when you throw a big rock into a pool, it splashes. You get big ripples. Basically, a tsunami is caused by displacement of Earth during an earthquake, usually. The asteroid impact would have caused a massive displacement of Earth. There is evidence for large tsunamis happening uh, around that time from debris being transported uh, around the ocean or in some cases very far on shore. <laughs> this research presents the first evidence, it seems, of potential mega tsunami mega ripples. Oh. You see, here's the thing. The petroleum industry, when they're searching for oil and gas, use a trick called 3D seismic imagery, which is to say they either use an industrial hammer or a thing that blows up to create shock waves that go down into the earth, seismic waves. And then as they bounce back, we can read the movement of those seismic waves to interpret what the layers look like down there. That's the thing they kind of used in Kong Skull Island. Yeah, that's the thing they pretended to use there. (laughs) Those are the bombs they were dropping. It's kind of like seismic sonar. Yeah. When the petroleum industry does this, they're searching for oil and gas layers specifically, or, or deposits, but they produce a bunch of data, just tons of information. So here in this study, the researchers got a hold of this sort of seismic imaging data from central Louisiana to examine the layering patterns underneath the state in a place where at the end Cretaceous, it would have been near the shoreline. So they were wondering, what kind of evidence can we find here of what was going on at this shoreline on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico from where the uh, impact happened? And what they identified was a particular layer about 1,500 meters down below the surface with fossilized ripples. Now, we get ripples in rocks not very uncommonly. 
Mm-hmm. But that's pretty, you know, if you get a, a shoreline, beach, depositional environments, sometimes you can get these ripple marks formed where the ancient sediment, the sand, was put up in these little ripples, these these little uh, uh, consecutive ridges of sand. And then if nothing disturbs those ripples, they'll get covered up in more sediment until now you have a layer of rock, the top of which has ripple marks on it. Yeah, it's it's the same ones when you go to the beach and you're in the shallows uh, at the beach, you'll see these patterns in the sand all over from the tide coming in and out. It yep. sculpts the sand into that. And yeah, if it gets turned to rock, those stay. You have ripples. These particular ripples are patterned up to one kilometer apart and an average of 16 meters tall. Wow. That's about 50 feet. Woof. These are big ripple marks. Yeah. The authors suggest that what may have done these ripple marks could have been tsunami waves. The way a tsunami works is that you have, again, a massive displacement of Earth that creates a p- pulse of water, right? You, you, it's a displacement of water that creates a wave that travels across the sea floor towards a shoreline where it starts to crawl up the shoreline and emerge as a big wave. Yeah, when you have a whole bunch of energy moving through the water, but then suddenly you shallow the water, you don't get rid of the energy, and that's why it rises up as a wave. And those waves coming up onto this shoreline may have created these ripples. They specify that at this time, the water in this particular area would have been about 60 meters deep. So quite deep down, which is deep enough to be disturbed by a tsunami wave, of course, but low enough down that after these ripples were formed, normal like storm wave action up on the surface wouldn't reach down and destroy them. You were mentioning the ripples on the beach. Those ripple marks sort of in the sand often are impermanent because... You know, the next day's weather is going to change and the water currents are going to change and it's going to wipe away those ripples. Or when you walk through them and kick them over, they're getting wiped away. Well, and and when the tide's coming in versus going out are going to make different ripples. But these may have been low enough, deep enough down that the currents in that area are stable enough that they stuck around. That's awesome. And since they are enormous, it is, it, it seems reasonable to suspect that the tsunami that may have caused these, especially given that they're about the right time, may have come from the impact at the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. And indeed, they mention in the article that the ripple marks are perpendicular to a line leading to the crater. Yes! (laughs) (laughs) That this is the direction ripples would have been formed from a tsunami wave coming from that direction. That's awesome. How cool is that? Wow. (laughs) This is apparently the first time such a structure, Mega Ripples, have been imaged this way. Hmm. Interesting. I I love stuff like this where, you know, when, when the petroleum companies are mapping out looking for stuff, they're not looking for paleo you know, findings. Not, not like this. Not, no. you know, they're not, they're not looking for evidence. Uh, about... They're not looking for mega ripples. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I love, I love stuff like this where, it, hey, we're not looking for this, but here's all the data. You can look for it yeah. in it. And boy, howdy, is it awesome that yeah. you, the thing we found. Just amassing data. Cause can you imagine, th- these are ripples so big That This just occurred to me. I just thought of it this way. You would not notice there were ripples if you were walking across this landscape. You would notice a ripple. There'd be a big hill, and then a kilometer later, (laughs) there'd be another big hill. You'd have to be scuba diving for a very long time (laughs) to be able to go, wait a minute, this is number three. Well, and that's the thing I was just about to say that is really cool to me. Even if these aren't from the Chicxulub impact. It's still awesome. That's like, still very cool. These are still a m- huge mass of ripples, probably from a tsunami. Like, that's still ridiculous. Yeah. 
even if it's not the tsunami that was caused by the thing that triggered the death of the Mesozoic. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what tsunami ripple marks look like from a normal size tsunami. Yeah, I, I d- I've I never heard know. about it. I wonder how big they are. Ooh. Well, that's all the time we have for the news. Oh, so many questions. (laughs) Well, hey, let's move on from talking about the traces of tsunamis to talking about the traces of living things. Segway. Nice. After we get back from a brief musical interlude, we will start our discussion on trace fossils. Yay. Will, when I say trace fossil, what comes to mind for you? For me, the the first things I think of are footprints and imprints. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, impressions, footprints. I often will also think of burrows. Yeah. That happens quite a bit. And I always think of coprolites. I, I, coprolites are one that I almost forget count as trace because it is a f- thing. Yeah, oh boy, you're getting ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I do, I, listeners, I, hopefully you are playing along. What do you think of when you think of trace fossils? Because when I was reading through references for this episode, I found that I, I do have a, a very biased viewpoint of trace fossils, as we'll get into. But first, some ex- explanations. Trace fossils are fossilized traces, footprints, burrows, evidence of life, acting upon the environment it's the things a hunter would use yes <laughs> to follow the trail of something living this is as opposed to body fossils body fossils are fossilized remains of body parts right bones teeth leaves wood uh, foraminifera shells anything that was once the p- part of the body of an organism the study of traces is called ichnology i c h n Ology. And ichnology is split into two different uh, subdivisions, neo-ichnology and paleo-ichnology. Once again, this, this always, it's like, a, we've, I think, brought up the term before, neontology, mm-hmm. which is the opposite to paleontology. Neo means new, paleo means old. Neontology is a term that I have only ever heard used by paleontologists. Yep. I wonder if it's the same with ichnology. Yeah, well, it's when you specified paleoichnology, there was a part of me that went, what? Yes. <laughs> ichnology. Obviously, you can study modern traces. Which makes perfect sense. Like, we study dinosaur footprints, but we take molds of deer and raccoon footprints all the time. All the time. So that's ichnology. I just never categorize it the same way in my brain. Yeah. And the study of traces today, neo ichnology is very important. Studying how organisms interact with their environment, footprints, burrows, things left behind by organisms. Uh, if you have been, I like, in any sort of naturalist program or something, you've probably examined footprints and scat and, you know, marks left on trees and stuff like that. Yeah, it's super important because they stay around longer than the animals usually do, so you can figure out who's here. Paleoichnology is the study of trace fossils. Just like we discussed uh, in the news section, how you can get ripples in the sand that then solidify into rock, burrows or footprints or other kinds of traces can end up solidified, concreted in the rock. Trace fossils are different from body fossils in a number of ways. Not just in, obviously, what they are fossils of, but the way they kind of function as scientific subjects. First and foremost, trace fossils are generally, and kind of almost by definition, direct evidence of behavior. Yeah. A bone is just a bone, but a footprint is something stepped here. A track, a burrow is something dug here. Usually, trace fossils also are found in situ, where they were formed. This is an issue that comes up with body fossils a lot. Did, was this animal, did it die here, or did it get washed down a river and now it's miles from where it actually lived? You can move around bones with a river, but if you use a river on a footprint, you just wash it away. Yes. So if you find a trackway, if you find a burrow, if you find a bite mark, you're finding it almost certainly 
where it was left. There are exceptions. You know, if something left a trace in a tree and the tree gets moved, obviously that's no longer where it was. Yeah, or if the stone gets yeah. shifted or moved. Another interesting quirk of trace fossils is that a single type of trace, different traces are ca- classified, as we'll get into in a little bit, a single type of trace can be made by multiple organisms. A simple burrow through the sand could be left by a worm, a crustacean, an insect. All sorts of different things can leave what essentially might look the same or very similar. For that reason, a lot of traces have very long histories. There are traces today that form, you know, in shallow oceans or on beaches or in rivers, in the sediment underneath them, that are basically the same as traces we find all the way back to the Cambrian. Because it's the same sort of organisms doing the same sort of things. On the flip side of that, one organism can leave many different types of traces, right? You can take a bite out of something and leave bite marks, walk across your habitat and leave a trackway, and then poop out the thing you ate and leave a coprolite and leave several different traces in your path. And one more thing, trace fossils are very often evidence of soft-bodied organisms. Trace fossils are extremely common in aquatic environments, especially marine environments, and a lot of the time they are worms or soft-bodied arthropods or things like that, the kinds of things that we typically don't get body fossils for. Animals that live in sediment often will have very soft bodies, which don't necessarily fossilize themselves very well, compared to bones and exoskeletons and teeth and wood and stuff like that. And indeed, the types of environments that are good for preserving body fossils are often not good for preserving trace fossils, and vice versa. Oh. A place that preserves sediment very well, a sediment structure like a burrow or a footprint, is not always necessarily a great place for preserving a bone. That makes sense. Like, especially because often to preserve a body fossil, you want it to be quickly buried and stay buried. But if you're wanting sediment preserved, you don't want to disturb it. Yes. So that makes a lot of sense. And it can have to do with the environment, what's in the environment, the kind of sediment that you have. So trace fo- studying trace fossils can in many ways be very different from studying body fossils. Now, already I have hinted a little bit at the inherent bias that I came into this with. I found uh, that there is an uh, excellent reference, and I will link to it in the blog post after the episode, that I found for this episode. It is a book called Ichnology, written by Boitois and Mangano from back in 2011, which served as the bulk of my information going into this episode. A few other references as well. And I was reading through this book and I was going, you know, they would describe stuff about trace fossils and then give examples. And it took me a while to realize that I had read quite a long ways into this book and they had not mentioned vertebrates. Yeah. It was almost entirely ocean organisms, freshwater organisms, invertebrates, worms and echinoderms and trilobites and arthropods and stuff like that. That's what most trace fossil research is like. And, it, and as we've mentioned before, that's also honestly what most body fossils are, oh, yeah. is invertebrates, often small invertebrates. Because that's what most animal life <laughs> yep. is. So here we are uh, exposing our well-known bias for vertebrate animals. <laughs> Don't worry, we will uh, talk about vertebrates throughout this episode. Oh, good. But this will be invertebrate uh, heavy, so uh, cheers to that. Trace fossils can be very difficult to interpret. Uh, When you find a trace fossil, you know, a a trace fossil can vary based on what sort of organism left it, what the behavior was. They can vary based on what kind of sediment they're left in. They can vary based on what kind of environment they were produced in. They can be very variable, which can make them difficult to interpret. And so they're often the, the subjects of lots of discussion. And one of the topics that has come under lots of discussion is the question of what counts as a trace. Ah. Apparently, there are differing opinions about this. I would like to read an incredible sentence out of that book, Ichnology, that I mentioned. Quote, 
As with most classifications, some fields are vague, and gray zones haunt the researcher who ventures towards the margins of a discipline. I love discovering <laughs> controversy in a topic that I didn't realize there was any in. Well, this is one of those where, you know, we, we have made it a habit of this podcast of asking very simple questions that have extremely complicated answers. Yes. Well, it's like we've talked, what counts as a fossil? Yep. I, yeah, that does not have a, the edges are blurry. When it comes to trace fossils, stricter definitions tend to suggest that a trace fossil is is the result of an organism interacting with a substrate. A substrate is a surface upon which stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You know, so in the case of an organism, that is usually the sediment or the rock that they are living on or moving over or whatever it is they're doing. And in the process, they leave a mark. They leave an evidence. They, they leave a trail of their activity on the substrate. This can include bioturbation, which is the process of disrupting the sediment. Footprints, burrows, nests, root cavities. So a root might go through sediment and then decompose, leaving a cavity behind in the shape of a root. <gasps> That's awesome. These kinds of structures often end up infilled. So what you will see, the, the actual fossil itself is, here's your rock, and there is this burrow-shaped a gap in it that is filled with a different type of rock. Yeah, like a vein of separate sediment going through the rock. Yes. There's also a process called bioerosion, which is when organisms remove, not just disturb, but remove. This can take the form of boring traces through rock or wood, right? If you think of insects boring through wood. Or snails drilling through clamshells will leave drill holes in them. Oh. Uh, depending on whose definition you're going by, this can also include feeding traces on leaves or on bone. You know, bite marks or, or gnaw marks, things like that. A wider definition of trace fossils will also include structures produced by organisms. Things organisms made which can include eggs, coprolites, which are fossilized poop, uh, nests that are built, like insect nests, spider webs, things like that can be, uh, are sometimes included under traces. Stratification in sediment caused by organisms. The classic example of this is stromatolites. Stromatolites are a structure formed when you have a microbial mat that sits on the surface and those microbes are trapping sediment between them in their mucus that leads to this layer of sediment getting trapped in the mat, and then the next generation of microbes grows on top of that. So you just get these layer upon layer upon layer as these microbes are constantly growing on top of the sedimentated <laughs> ancestors that they had. That, yeah, that makes perfect sense as a trace fossil, but I never would have thought of it. Now, I have seen the argument made that that doesn't count as a trace fossil. By th According to some definitions, you wouldn't count that as a trace fossil because it does not reflect behavior or morphology. It's not mm. telling you about the anatomy of the thing that left it, and it's not telling you about any behavior. It's just that they were there. In, in a, a similar vein, they're uh, sometimes argued not to be counting as traces are what are called death marks. This can happen, for example, if like a carcass f drifts to the bottom of a lake or something and just impacts the sediment, that impact mark, even if it's preserved, some would argue that that doesn't count as a trace because an organism didn't, it wasn't a behavioral thing that happened. You can't, it doesn't trace you to anything. <laughs> yeah, it just, that's just where, yeah, it might as well have been a rock that fell in there. Similarly, uh, sometimes you can get drag marks from shells, or I've seen this uh, with ammonite shells, being dragged by a current over the floor of the, the sea, you know, through the mud or something. It's just a shell. The animal's gone. Or maybe it's a carcass of the animal. But it's not behavior. It's just a dead body being dragged across the mud. Death marks, which some would say, not a trace fossil. Huh. And then, of course, there is the undisputed uh, case of pseudo-traces. Things that look like traces that just 
aren't traces. These can be marks left by water, these can be rock uh, collapses, this can be uh, volcanic activity, can leave like burrow shapes in there. Yesterday, uh, we got an email or a message to the museum of someone who said, hey, I found a cool rock, I think it has a dinosaur footprint in it. This is a very common message to be received by museums, and I looked at the picture and it was these sort of depressions in this rock that admittedly did kind of look a bit like toes that are formed commonly in rocks like limestone by water moving over them, carving out these bowl shapes. Pseudo traces. Yeah. For the purposes of this episode, we will just talk about all of the things that are sometimes considered traces because it's more inclusive and more fun that way. <laughs> and and we aren't picky acknologists because neither <laughs> of true. us are acknologists. That's true. But suffice it to say that, yeah, there are blurry lines, there are differing definitions, but under any definition, there is a variety of things that count as traces. How traces are classified, once, you know, we agree that they are traces, can also be very detailed and very interesting. Traces are often classified in part based on how they're preserved. So, for example, a trace can be preserved in ancient sediment, like a burrow that's preserved in there. It can be at the top of a bed or at the top of a rock, you know, footprints or something like that. They can be underneath a rock layer. You know, I've, I've seen some places where you can get the underside of footprints. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. The depression the, the footprint causes. Yeah. And these have names, right? Hypo relief describes something at the base of a, of a sediment bed. Epi relief describes a trace fossil at the top of a sediment bed, at the top of a rock layer. So there are different classifications based on what it's preserved in, how it's preserved. But a particularly popular and I think intuitive and very interesting way to classify traces is based on the behavior that caused them. Classification by ethology. The study of behavior. Traces, categories of traces are given names based on what kind of trace they are. Here is a non-all-inclusive list of some of my favorite examples. Cubicnia is the term that describes resting traces. So this is a place where an organism just sort of dug into the sediment. You can imagine like a little, like a horseshoe crab or something, just kind of digging its way in and hanging out there for a second. Repicnia are locomotion traces, trackways, footprints, an organism moved, an animal moved across the sediment. Paschichnia are grazing traces, evidence of searching or foraging while moving around. On the other side, predichnia are <laughs> predation traces, which can include bite marks or drill marks. Domichnia are dwelling traces, which include burrows or borings into wood or something. Similarly, calichnia is the name for nesting traces, which can include all sorts of different nests. Fugichnia are escape traces. These uh, often will happen when you'll have a burrow and you can see that the burrow was rapidly adjusted because a bunch of dirt fell on it. <laughs> and the whatever was in the burrow had to dig its way up so it wouldn't suffocate in its burrow. Huh. And one of my absolute favorites, Morticnia, traces that preserve the final movements, the final activities of an organism's life, as evidenced by the fact that the organism is also fossilized there. Yes. There are examples, uh, particularly with arthropods, like trilobites, of trackways that end with the fossilized body of the animal that left the trackways. There are also examples of like bivalves, clams and stuff in the burrows that they dug, fossilized within it. These are called morticnia. Uh, <laughs> what is it from Kill Bill? Is it the seven step punch? Is <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That trilobite took its last several steps and then died. <laughs> Trace fossil research is very heavily focused on animals since those are the most uh, dramatically behaving organisms. But you can also get plants, like I mentioned, root cavities. Uh, I also came across a 2009 study that described traces, uh, modern traces, left by a giant shelled amoeba oh. as it rolled its way across 
the bottom of the, the, the water in the mud. The study noted that these traces seem similar to fossil traces from about 2 billion years ago. Yep, yep, yep. Which kind of emphasizes the point that, yeah, it's not always animals leaving traces. You can get other things. Yes, I, you mentioned that, and then I went, wait a minute, I, I remember this. Yeah, because that's one of the potential candidates for trails we have at the earliest onset of when life and stuff might have been getting around. Yes. Now, within those categories specific trace fossils, specific types of locomotion traces or burrowing traces or feeding traces are given names, mm -hmm. scientific names. This is ichnotaxonomy. We've mentioned this many times on the podcast that when you find a trace fossil, it gets its own name. Part of this is because it's very, very difficult to identify who left the trace. Yes. It's hard to say, oh, we found this footprint. We will name it for the animal that left it because very often we don't have that. And like I mentioned, a lot of traces can be made by multiple different types of organisms. <laughs> the thought that just came to my head to explain that is like, if you were, you know, looking at a, a, a muddy trail, you could identify the kind of the kind and probably size of shoe, <laughs> like down to the brand that made it. But you couldn't tell me who left it or even if it was male or female or even their age. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't tell me anything about the person who left it, just that they were wearing that kind of shoe. <laughs> we don't know anything else other than that. So it, it is an Adidas, an, an Adidas size 12. And so traces get their own scientific designations, but they still follow the same system kind of as we give to organisms often binomial names, genus species. Most commonly for trace fossils, you will hear ichnogenera and ichnogenus, which are called ichnogenus instead of genus to specify because, as, I, as we just explained, genus and ichnogenus mean different things. Mm -hmm. they, are, they don't quite operate under the same rules. Some examples of common ichnogenera, diplichnites is a trace that is parallel rows of small walking tracks, typically assigned to various arthropods. Scolathos is a very popular uh, and widespread trace fossil that are vertical burrows, typically often in like sandstone and things like that that can be left by worms and such. Growlator, for our vertebrate fans, are small three-toed footprints that are found on land that are assigned to small dinosaurs, bipedal dinosaurs. Cool. Sometimes, when there is enough detail and variation, researchers will even identify ichnospecies within a genus. These can vary based on, you know, what kind of behavior it was or what kind of animal left it. Sometimes you'll even see ichnosubspecies used. And I've even seen reference to ichnofamilies, to group genera within. But this can be very tricky, as I described before, because there's a lot of variation. The What the trace is left in, the sediment it's in, can have an impact. And also because behavior varies so much, right? It, one step might not be like the step before it. How you walk on this day might be different from how you walk the next day, right? If your foot is hurting you, or if you're walking over weird terrain... Or if it's rainy out and you're slipping around, that can have an impact on the kind of traces you're leaving. Yeah, am I walking, running, or skipping? Yes. Yeah, it, yeah. one animal can move. Well, it's, it makes me think of watching a lot of aquatic animals to where it's like, yeah, this is how it walks around. When it gets scared, it does this weird swimming thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that could leave very different traces. You know, and then you know, some of them like roll up or something. Like, oh, yeah. All sorts of weird things. And this is further complicated by the fact that you can, whenever you choose to, do something different. Mm -hmm. There, This is seen in trace fossils sometimes. These are called compound trace fossils, examples that show changes in behavior. So, for example, there is a trace fossil known as Cruziana, which is a locomotion trace, typically, though not always, assigned to trilobites, walking through uh, the mud, often is found grading into a trace fossil called Rusophycus, which is a resting trace, where this trilobite 
walked for a bit, and then settled in and stayed there. And left two different traces, one that becomes the other. That's so great. So you get this gradation between trace fossils, which can be very complicated for taxonomy, because now it's two things. So from what I've read, the the common practice is to name it for the dominant trace. So if it's a long walking path and then a little resting trace, you might name it the walking trace name, but then include a detailed description <laughs> of what actually is included there. <laughs> it's a walking trace with resting on the side. Yes. And then also, there is another type of trace fossil that makes things complicated called composite trace fossils. Traces within traces. Uh... A common example of this is that you can get dwelling traces that another dweller came into afterwards. So beetles will, will often make these nests, especially like dung beetles will make nests in poop that can then fossilize. And you'll often find smaller burrows and chambers in these nests from other animals that came in to live in there. So you have a nest with smaller nests inside of it. You can also have burrows through coprolites. Or there are a couple examples I know of, of bite marks on coprolites. Mm -hmm. So there is a trace fossil, your poop, with another trace fossil in it of a, of a burrower or a dweller or a feeding activity. There are also traces that are made by multiple organisms together. Uh, the way the book described this was multiple architects can create the same trace. Cool. The example they give is that there are some ecosystems today where lobsters, crabs, and fish, certain species of those three groups of animals, will all burrow in the same general area, sometimes connecting their burrows and creating these interconnected burrow systems that three different animals might have created, three completely different types of animals. Very cool. So trace fossils can get quite complicated, which can... Basically, it means that when you're identifying a trace fossil, you have to be very careful and very descriptive. Well, and this makes perfect sense. As we always like to say, our efforts to categorize and organize the natural world are, are doomed to fail at some level regardless, because the world is not built on an organized, <laughs> systemized way. Like, So we can't perfectly organize everything, because that's, that's not what natural systems are like. Uh, but especially with trace fossils, it makes sense because it's behavior, mm -hmm. and it's it's well, it's what would happen all the time uh, when people say like, "What things does this animal do?" So, all right, well, typically they do these things, but this individual does these things because it learned how to do them, right? And now that's it's like that happened at the aquarium all the time. So it's like, all right, well, usually they don't do this, but there's always going to be that one weirdo who then does the thing they don't do. And so you can't categorize a, a organized list of the ways they walk. Right. You know, or the ways they feed or how they move or what they do, because there's always going to be one or two of them that won't do those things or will do something else because of an injury or a behavioral quirk. And there's no solid line between one behavior and the next. Mm -mm. They'll grade into each other. So trace fossils can be very useful and very interesting, but also complex. They can record different types of behaviors, sometimes happening at the same time or one right after the other. It can be multiple organisms producing one structure. Traces can even record, in some of the more exciting examples, direct interactions between organisms. So all traces tend to be behavior Sometimes you can find direct interaction. I know of a few examples of trackways, for example, where evidence of herd behavior has been inferred. These are often dinosaur trackways because two different sets of footprints will seem to respond to each other, that they'll be parallel to each other or one will sort of uh, adjust as it gets near the other one that look like two different animals responding to each other's presence, walking alongside each other. There are also examples that I've heard of 
of trace fossils where you will get, say, a walking track of an arthropod or something, a little spider or an insect, and you can follow this arthropod track, and then it ends, and where it ends, there is a track of a larger animal. (laughs) Often like an amphibian track, like in the Carboniferous, you'll get a tetrapod track. I remember when we were in, I think this was when we were in Mississippi for SEAVP back in 2000, whatever that year was, there was a guy who had a slab of rock he was showing around that had a bunch of trackways on the surface of it. And there was an arthropod trackway. There's these little dig, 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 little little scratches of a bug walking around. And it ended at a footprint of a tetrapod, of a, mm-hmm. of a vertebrate animal that looked for all the world like this little bug's day ended under that foot. <laughs> Which is just, that that sounds like something a writer would come up with <laughs> for, for a movie or a book, and I love it so much. And that gets at another interesting and important aspect of trace fossils. They are rarely found alone. Sometimes, sometimes you get, here is a trace. Here, here we found a footprint. We found a burrow. But often you get ichno fossils, trace fossils, in communities, especially when we are talking about areas with entire ecosystems preserved, just like you can get a fossil site that has body fossils, skeletal and tooth remains or shell remains of many different animals, you will often find fossil sites preserving a patch of lake bed or reef or deep marine sediment with many different traces in it. You've got burrows over here. You've got grazing traces here. You've got walking traces. These are called ichnocenoses, trace fossil communities. And these are often a really cool demonstration of what, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because on the one hand, they are, here's a signature of what kinds of animals, what kinds of organisms dwelled in this place. But even more directly, it is, Here's a record of the variety of behaviors that were happening in this place. Well, it's 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 like the sediment version of a trail camera. Uh, yeah. It's here's who walked by here or sniffed around or looked for food or burrowed here, which makes perfect sense because if like you said earlier, areas that preserve ichnofossils are not always the same for bodies, but if this area is good at preserving footprints, it's going to preserve anyone's footprints. So when you see descriptions of ichnofossils, uh, particularly in marine sediments or aquatic sediments, a lot of the time it, it, you know, I I think that the way we interact with paleontology, a lot of the time we're talking about individual finds. Here is this one cool trace fossil that shows this one cool thing. But so often it's sedimentologists saying, here is the variety of traces we found in this rock layer, this whole community. And I should note before we move on, and I think this is the best place to note it, that there are examples where the behavior of trace makers shapes the ecosystem. Bioturbators, right, organisms that are disturbing sediment, bioturbation, can sometimes be ecosystem engineers. So you can find, both in trace fossils and the modern world, traces that not only dominate an ecosystem, but form the shape of the ecosystem, creating what that book referred to as ichno-landscapes. <laughs> Examples. Here in our modern world, there are many places where mammals, small mammals, rodents, rabbits, things like that, create extensive burrows that end up creating entire underground systems and changing the surface topography. In tidal flats in the Bahamas, there is a type of shrimp called Glypturus, which create complex burrows and mounds that end up being homes for lots of other organisms. You just get these mound-filled tidal flats. And then, of course, one of the most dramatic examples are termite mounds Mm -hmm. in South Africa. These termites who build huge underground chambers and huge above-ground mounds so that the traces of these organisms are the shape of this landscape. Yes. 
<laughs> they, well, they, they create the skyline. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. It's another one of those examples where it's just, I had never considered what all a trace indicated. But yeah, it makes complete sense that these massive structures count. Like these fall under ecology, and that's really, really interesting. Yeah. And indeed, there is a lot more deeper variety in traces, in ecology. It can get very detailed in how we classify traces, how we identify traces. But the other part of ecology, and particularly paleoecology, studying trace fossils, is coming to understand what we can learn about the past from trace fossils. Uh, which, now that I say that, uh, now that I think about it, anything behavioral with trace fossils is always learning about the past, uh, even if it's modern traces. <laughs> because that, that footprint, you it, it happened in the past. Yeah, ichnology is always retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes ichnology is, is focused on the sediment itself and how the sediment interacts. But, yeah, if you're looking at what the organism was doing, yeah, it's, it's in the past. <laughs> but... One of the reasons that paleoecology is so popular, that trace fossils are such a popular thing to study, is because we can learn a ton. They are extremely useful for understanding life and Earth history. And after this short musical break, we will discuss that in some detail. I think the most obvious thought when it comes to what we can learn from trace fossils is about the behavior of organisms in the past. But trace fossils are very, very commonly used, and in fact, pot maybe even more commonly used in some respects, to interpret environmental information, geological and geographical information. Ichnofossil communities, those ichnocenoses, the, the, the assemblages, of traces are shaped by various features in their environment. When you're underwater, what kinds of traces you're finding are going to be determined by what lives there, of course, and what lives there and how they behave are going to be influenced by what the floor is made of, by right? mud or sand or silt, by the water movement, if it's active or calm water, by the depth of the water, oxygen in the water, salinity, the salt content, food supply, all those different factors are going to influence what lives there and how they're behaving. On land, it's very similar. What biome are you in? What's the climate like? What's the floor made of? All that kind of stuff is going to change not just the individual organisms, but the whole community structure is going to be different. So ichnofossils and ichnofossil communities are strongly related to the environment that they form in. Many ichnofossils, and particularly ichnofossil assemblages, have narrow environmental ranges. They are only found in certain types of environments. Interesting. The types of activities, the interaction between organisms and their substrate, that we see in a desert are going to be very different from what we see in a river or a lake, or the deep sea, or a reef. And in many cases, when you have a well-preserved assemblage of trace fossils, you can even look at patchiness across your assemblage to identify microhabitats. I've seen references to studies that have found differences between the river channel and the river bed. Oh. Which, of course, makes total sense. Those are very different conditions for the types of organisms living in and around that sediment, leaving traces behind. Or different parts of a reef. You will find different types of burrowing and feeding and walking behaviors of all your invertebrates and such that are living there. That makes so much sense. It, it makes me think of how at the Gray Fossil site, there's been talk about trying to determine where the edges of the pond mm -hmm. were once we start finding, like, reeds and water plants that would be growing in the shallows yeah or uh, baby animals and mm -hmm. well-preserved stuff yeah i like that that's pretty yeah. awesome same concept with trace fossils not only their style of preservation but what's actually living in that part of that ecosystem can change 
So trace fossils can be very specific to an environment, but as I mentioned over time, specific types of trace fossils, specific ichnotaxa, ichnogenic genera, ichnospecies, are often widespread across time. So what we find are repeating trends over time in ichnofossil communities. So similar ichnofossil communities are grouped together into larger categories called ichnofacies. Now, if we have geology people out there, they may recognize the term facies, because in geology, a facies is a particular rock or rock layer or rock bed or patch of ancient sediment in your column that has particular features. Share particular features of the sediment, of what's in it, of its coloration, of the signs of chemical activity in it. This big patch of sandstone is all united under these traits related to how it formed and where it formed. Ichnofacies are very similar. And ichnofacies describes a type of ichnological community, trace fossil community, that is related to particular conditions of formation that we can see over time. So you might find a similar community in the Cambrian and then in the Permian and then in the Jurassic period that are a sim the same ichnofacies indicating the same sort of environment. Yeah, if you're finding the similar kinds of burrows and footprints and feeding traces means this was probably a very similar ecosystem, even if vastly different groups of organisms were the ones making these traces. Yes. Here are a few examples. Ichnofacies are often named for the dominant trace fossils in them, the dominant ichnotaxa. So the Silonychnus ichnofacies is dominated by the ichnotaxa Silonychnus, or things similar to it, which are burrows of ghost crabs, oh. along with other burrows. This ichnofacies has all those burrows, plus commonly trackways of vertebrates and invertebrates, root traces, and coprolites. These and other factors indicate air exposure and freshwater input from the rain, which tends to indicate transitional regions between marine and continental. Beach. Beach, tidal settings, things like that. A scolothos, ichnofacies, is dominated by vertical burrows scolothos, of suspension feeders, which reflects well-oxygenated and well-supplied waters, often along the shorelines. Coprinosphera ichnofacies are named for coprinosphera, which we have talked about before in episode 30, which are dung beetle balls. Oh, uh, yeah. The nests, the brooding chambers dung beetles make in poop balls. These are associated in this assemblage with lots of other insect traces, bees, wasps, ants, termites, and this type of assemblage tends to correlate with savannas and grasslands and places like that. And one more, there is the Gralator ichnofacies, dominated by theropod tracks, three-toed footprints of dinosaurs, bipedal dinosaurs, often at lake shores, where they're walking in the mud or in the sand, leaving these footprints behind. Yes. These ichnofacies are trends over time. So we will see, like you said, the same patterns repeated over and over again, even if the specific ichnospecies within are changing. So, for example, the Gralator ichnofacies in the late Triassic, the dominant track you find is typically a type of theropod track called Gralator. But in the early Jurassic, it's Eubrontes. In the early Cretaceous, it's Gindungornipes. And in the Cenozoic, it's Avipeta. <laughs> Bird tracks. Same basic idea associated with similar environments and other trace fossils, but different organisms doing those same behaviors, leaving those same traces. Well, and I let, like, now that it's it's been put into perspective, this is the same thing we do with body fossil assemblages. When it's like, all right, well, you know, here we found Spinosaurus aegypticus, and around it we found fish scales and fish bones and croc fossils and teeth. So a lake or river, 
yeah. freshwater lake or river. Right. And here's our large predator. Here are our small herbivores. Mm-hmm. Here are our plants. Yeah. And then we find, you know, these other animals, which all have grazing teeth, you know, or browsing teeth. You know, so we know that they had to be around grass or shrubs or yeah. trees. Community structures and behaviors and activities tend to be de- so dependent on their environment that they will recur over time. A grassland is going to be very similar over time, even if what is in there is changing. Well, yeah, it, it, if the shape of your environment keeps you know, showing up, there are certain ways to often interact with that shape, that ecosystem, that just makes sense. And because of this, looking through geologic time, tracking changes in ichnofacies can provide very detailed understandings of how environments are changing. So a very common example is sea level change, right? You can track just based on what org- what, what traces of organisms you're finding, how this region was changing based on sea level. And as I was looking through the book, there were entire chapters devoted to very specific information you can get, like what kind of lake you were looking at. Is this a lake that is slowly draining? Is it a lake that is slowly filling up? Because that's going to be reflected in the kinds of fossils you're finding there. So in this respect, assemblages of ichnofossils, not even looking at one or the other, just entire communities over time, can tell us a ton about climate changes and sea level changes and all sorts of regional shifts. Now, one other very common way that we will often use fossils to tell us, to help us understand the geologic past is with dating. Index fossils are a very, we've talked about this before, an index fossil is a type of fossil that is very abundant, only in a particular range of time. Thus, if you find it, you have a sense of where you are in time just by the presence of that fossil. Trace fossils are often not great for this because, like I said, they are really restricted to their environment, but often have very wide time ranges. So it's it's rare that trace fossils are good for placing yourself in your st- stratigraphic column of time, though there are some exceptions. One particularly famous exception is a trace fossil known as Treptichnus, which is a fan-shaped burrow. And the reason that it's fan-shaped is because the burrow records an organism repeatedly probing up to the surface, digging a little forward and making a probe up to the surface, going back down and then doing it again, and it creates this kind of fan shape as it probes around. This is one of the features in the geologic record that marks the beginning of the Cambrian period. Oh. And indeed, it is one of the earliest known complex burrows. And speaking of which, not only do ichnofossils, trace fossils, help us understand major changes in earth history, in geography, and in environment, they are also very useful for understanding major changes in life history. We have already alluded to probably the most major event in life history, which is life Mm -hmm. happening. You would imagine that as soon as there was life, there could be traces of life. And indeed, that's true. As we've mentioned before on the podcast, the earliest definite, you know, agreed upon evidence of life on the planet are stromatolites. Those layered sediment columns left underneath microbial mats where they grow generation by generation, which, as I mentioned before, are sometimes counted as trace fossils. Uh, The same could be said for early chemical evidence that is often suggested that might be evidence of life metabolism, which in some respects might be counted as trace fossils. The more strictly defined, uh, the more strictly defined behavioral traces, you know, burrows and tracks and so on, are suspected throughout early Earth history. And when I say early Earth history, I mean the first few billion years of Earth (laughs) history. There have been many cases of trackways and burrows suggested, and a lot of these are very controversial. A lot of them are highly debated. 
There's a lot of back and forth. There have been many cases of suspected trackways that have turned out to be, you know, this was a little volcanic vent or something, or this was something completely different. This was an inorganic trace. These go back as far as 2 billion years, and as you can imagine, they are very interesting to people trying to understand early life. But, in all likelihood, any traces we're finding back then are probably going to be microbial traces before we have complex animal life. The earliest well-known traces to organismal behaving in your environment, animal activity, yeah, agreed upon, are from the Ediacara which is right before the Cambrian, we find trace evidence of microbial mat grazers, things that grazed on those microbe mats, simple burrows, not branching, not complex, just very simple burrowing creatures. And then there's the Cambrian explosion, which we talked about way back in episode nine, which is the time period where life on the planet, particularly animal life, ramps up in diversification uh, over the course of the Cambrian period. And we have all sorts of cool new types of life and lifestyles being explored, which goes along with an increasing in diversity of trace fossils. We see much more diverse and complex trace fossils, including trackways. Burrows not only become more complex, like Treptichnus, but also deeper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Organisms, animals are able to go deeper into the sediment we see more complex feeding traces, and also larger traces. The burrows, the trackways get bigger as animals are getting bigger. So just like the body fossil record tracks this major shift in life history, so do the trace fossils. In fact, we talked, I think, about in episode 9, there there is a, a event around this time known as the substrate revolution. Yep. Because of the way animals are disturbing the sediment, it changes the literal foundational structure of ecosystems. Yeah, and it's it's often thought that this is a reaction to the ramping up of the predator-prey arms race during the Cambrian explosion, because now you need to hide from predators that are looking at you with these new eyes. Yeah, the same reason we see more uh, hard parts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to be protected. And so it's it's fantastic that not only do our hard-bodied fossils increase during this time, but our trace fossils increase and diversify for very similar reasons. Yeah. And that's really, really interesting. As we follow the trace fossil record over time, we can also see not just changes in what is around in general, but changes of where things are living. The Ichno fossil record can track colonization of new environments. So over time, we see trace fossil evidence of the earliest complex ecosystems showing up in deep sea environments, in tidal environments, in freshwater environments. Oftentimes, a lot of our earliest evidence that life moved into rivers or moved into the deep sea is through trace fossils. And of course, uh, again, revealing our uh, bias, <laughs> The colonization of land is recorded in the trace fossil record. Oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Arthropod trackways are often regarded as the earliest evidence of complex life. Moving on to land, arthropod trackways are known from sand dunes, wind-produced sand dunes. So on land, as far back as the late Cambrian early Ordovician. Wow. Thought to have been formed probably by relatively large amphibious arthropods that were able to go out onto land for at least a little bit. Over the course of the Silurian and the Devonian, we see increasing diversity in trackways of invertebrates on land. Well-established ichno communities in terrestrial environments by the late Devonian. And of course, around this same time, we see the earliest trackways of tetrapods. Back in episode 77, we talked about how some of our earliest evidence of vertebrates, right, fish, moving up onto land comes from trackways, behavioral interactions with the land that they are moving up onto. Proof of walking. Starting in the Devonian, we have things like temnospondyls and early relatives of amniotes. And 
later and later we grow in diversity. We eventually see reptile tracks, synapsid tracks, dinosaur tracks, and so on. Trace fossils also track diversification periods. Just like the Cambrian explosion, we see a diversification of lifestyles. We see greater diversity in our ichnofossils. The Mesozoic Marine Revolution, which is the overhaul of ecosystems in the the oceans during the Mesozoic, which we mentioned back in episode 117 Mm -hmm. last time, is also reflected in trace fossils, particularly in feeding traces. (laughs) Because one of the things that characterizes this shift is lots more hard part devouring animals. (laughs) In the late Paleozoic, feeding traces on plants become more and more complex and diverse as insects become more complex and diverse. And in the Cenozoic, here's one Will will enjoy, we see in Paleosols, so this is the last 60 million years or so, Paleosols are ancient soils. We see a radiation of structures produced by bees, ants, termites, wasps, and beetles following the radiation of those groups of animals. Yeah, that's so... Well, and I, I love that because one of some of my favorite videos or things I've ever seen on the internet are the people who will preserve ant nests yeah. by pouring molten... You know, I think it's usually like, you know, uh, 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 like lead. A, and a resin or something? Oh, okay. It's, it's usually metal, yeah, uh, that I've seen in, like, uh, maybe aluminum, uh, but it's some, one of the lighter metals. And, yeah, you, you'll pour it in, and it will fill out all the tunnels. And I've actually seen some of these in person that I saw at a fair, and you can see all of the chambers. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense that if we can do that artificially, it should be happening naturally as well. Yeah. They get infilled and we start to see more complexity of them, which I think is a very cool to think about that as organisms, plants, animals, etc., are changing, their impact on the environment is changing. Their literal physical impact on the environment tracks those changes. Yeah. This is how we can track diversity of nesting and locomotion and stuff like that. And then on the other hand... Ichnofossils can also track when the opposite happens. <laughs> Trace fossil diversity has been well studied for a few of our mass extinctions in the past. Uh, notably, uh, the Permian extinction. In the late Permian, there are lots of diverse trace fossils. And then when we get into the early Triassic on the other side of the Permian mass extinction, episode 45, the traces are small and simple and very homogenous, very similar across the board, which is also what we see in the body fossils at that time. You know, we talked about, I I believe in that episode, we talked about Lystrosaurus, the famous uh, uh, synapsid that took over the world (laughs) after the Permian extinction because it was one of the only large-bodied animals that survived. Mm -hmm. Similarly, and I think we mentioned this in episode 5, during the end Cretaceous mass extinction, Not only do we see lots of disappearance in uh, body fossil groups, but there is a major drop in the diversity of feeding traces on plants by insects. Evidence of drop in insect diversity, if not in their morphological diversity, like the number of species, their taxonomic diversity or their, their anatomy, their behavioral diversity, what kinds of things they're doing was diminished, and we see that in the traces they leave on plants. The the trace fossil record in this sense is this wonderful, I I hesitate to say a shadow, even though shadow feels very appropriate Mm -hmm. uh, physically, is this counterpart to the body fossil record. And like I said before, since fossil sites that are great for body fossils are not always the same as sites that are great for trace fossils, This means we can get this type of evidence in different areas. Yes. In a place with no dinosaurs, we can still find evidence of an extinction event. Even if there are no dinosaurs, no forams, no nothing, if there's trace fossils, we might still be able to see those signs. And it will give us a different point of view from the body fossils. Now we're looking at what behaviors persisted and maintained yeah and it's much more of a community ecosystem level viewpoint and we talk about this every now and then 
But so often when we talk about uh, evolution, radiations, and, and extinctions, we often get hung up on numbers of species. Yes. Right? File, you know, 96% of blah, blah, blah went extinct at this time, and all of the pterosaurs and all of the plesiosaurs and whatnot. But one thing that is very common for paleontologists to examine is the effect that it had on community structure. How did herbivores do? As How did herbivory fare in this? How did burrowing as a lifestyle fare during this event? And ichnofossils are a great way for us to examine those kinds of things, right? Did, did we lose lifestyles in this extinction event? Do we see the origination of a new way of behaving during this radiation event? And the answer oftentimes is, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Over the course of the early evolution of insects, episode 99, we see new styles of feeding on plants show up on plants. Which is is a fantastic tool to have, you know, a point of view to have, because that can have massive effects on the ecosystem going forward. You know, we, we always go back to the mammoth step as a perfect example of when you lose a taxa. Yeah, a biome. Uh, you can, like, you, you lost mammoths. You lost the mammoth step. Yeah. You know, if you lose burrowers that are no longer churning up your sediment and you know, allowing water to permeate it or to allow other organisms that can't form those burrows to get down in there, your sediment might suddenly behave differently, Mm -hmm. which can then affect everyone else that lives on it. So like this can be very crucial that you might not be aware of just looking at the body fossils. If you like, you can find an animal and not be sure it's a burrower and not know that you've lost a burrower when it goes extinct. But if you look at the burrows, yep. you can see the shift. I love it. And this was the part that, for me, I, it took me a little bit by surprise. Not that it exists. I was aware of that. But how much detail and effort goes into these kinds of analyses. And again, talking about our biases, you know, we mentioned at the beginning the kinds of things we think of when we think of trace fossils. And for me, it's not this. It's not this kind of thing. No. I think that I'm going to say we, and I mean I, <laughs> often overlook this aspect of paleontology. There's a ton of information that comes from the trace fossil record. And then, of course, the stuff that I think of, we can learn about individual behaviors from trace fossils. Yes. We can zoom way in and find lots of examples of specific things we can learn about individual organisms or individual species from their traces. Probably the most famous are footprints. Yeah. I, footprints are studied very extensively, especially in vertebrates, right? Dinosaur tracks and elephant tracks and things like that. These are great for understanding motion. There have been a lot of studies that use footprints as a proxy for understanding how animals move. This has been done in dinosaurs a lot, right? Yeah, a ton. Look at the the trackway and can we measure the distance between the tracks and the size of the tracks and get an estimate of the speed this animal walked at. I talked to a researcher several years ago who was attempting, I don't know where the state of this research is now, to see if they could estimate the weight of an organism based on footprints, based on the force it was putting down into the sediment. Makes sense. And of course, as I mentioned before, group behavior can come out of these kinds of things. Evidence of herding behavior or family living behavior can come out of footprint evidence. Also, uh, nesting evidence. Yes, that was one of the first things that came to my mind is when we find those groupings, those, those huge communities of nests that have been left behind yeah which have been found for dinosaurs and also i believe at least one site for pterosaurs yes we have group nesting there was also that study from a while ago we might have mentioned this in episode 61 uh behavior the uh scratch marks that were attributed to some sort of dinosaur and maybe like a dinosaur 
doing a courtship display. Yeah, mating dance. A mating thing. dance. Yes, yes, we definitely have spoken about that. We might actually, it might have been in the news. I think it was when in it news. came out because our podcast has been going for a very long time. <laughs> and of course, one of my favorite types of trace fossils are coprolites, which are super fun trace fossils. Fossil poops. We've talked about we've talked about coprolites a lot on the news, but also we did an episode about coprolites. Episode 30, check it out, can tell us about diet. We've learned about parasites from coprolites. We can learn. Uh, there was a thing in the news j- just, what was this, last episode, I think, about the beetle that was extremely well preserved inside a coprolite. Better than we thought we could find preserved things in coprolites? Yes, exactly. Like, it, coprolites not only can give us an idea of how did this animal poop, like, what, what was its poop like, <laughs> but also what what was left in it, and it's probably one of my favorite trace fossils, even if I didn't think of it as a trace fossil on yeah. average, now that I know it counts. <laughs> There's also, I mentioned earlier, uh, interactions between organisms. Bite marks. Bite marks are a great resource for understanding how an animal eats. Mm -hmm. If you've got, like for uh, tyrannosaurs, we've got bite marks from tyrannosaurs that have been used to infer how much pressure they're putting into their bite, how they're moving their jaw as they bite. And then we've got tyrannosaur coprolites that give us a sense of how much they're eating of their prey that are that they're swallowing bone and how their digestion works we got evidence at both ends yep yep from trace fossils of understanding their lifestyle their behavior well one of my favorite things about bite marks is revealing where on the prey they're biting yeah, what part of the body they're targeting because mm-hmm. like i know there was at least one of uh, uh on the frill of some ceratopsian yeah i think it might have been triceratops i think it was triceratops and it's the fact that at some point, a tyrannosaur did bite its frill mm-hmm. and stuff, which is a part that I would have assumed you would have avoided biting because it's just a big chunk of bone. You would think. Uh, and yeah, you can get an idea of where they were targeting, which is very cool. There was also a, a, re- a study that came out not too long ago that was, if I remember correctly, it was a fossilized turtle smushed found in the footprint of a sauropod. Yes. Uh, and it was thought that this might have been stepped on by a sauropod. Which, like, sorry for the trouble, but we can only hope. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> we get evidence of parasitism. So I mentioned uh, uh, things burrowing in other things' nests, kleptoparasitism. Uh, marks on bones or on shells can be evidence of parasites sort of living in or on skeletons and exoskeletons. Ah, while I was reading for this episode, I found that there is at least one evidence, case of evidence of mutualism in the trace fossil record. These are in Miocene soils, so probably 10, 15 million years old, fossilized fungus combs, to so parts of fungus, found in termite nests. <gasps> oh... The earliest example, at least according to the reference I found, which I think was the book, so 10 years old, earliest known example of termite fungiculture. That's farming traces. That's fantastic. Which actually was another one of the categories. There is a category of trace fossil named for farming traces. It might have been agrichnia, like agriculture. I I, hope. I think that was it. (laughs) If not, change it now. (laughs) That's really cool. That's that's one of those, and we've mentioned this with other things when we find those ridiculous fossils every now and then. That's one of those behaviors I would assume there would be almost no way yeah, for us to confirm. You're just not going to see it. Yeah, we're just, we'll never know when leaf cutter ants started that. Well, behavior. dang. Oh, well. And you'd be wrong. And boy, <laughs> boy, would I, and I can't be happier to be wrong. Now, this is just a quick list of a few ideas of cases of ways we can infer specific behavior from trace fossils. But we are in the fascinating position of the podcast now where we have talked about trace fossils in a bunch of other episodes. So, you know, for uh, we, we often refer to other episodes in a very Wikipedia style where it's like, yo, and in this fossil site, they found pterosaurs. If you want to learn more about pterosaurs, check out episode 79. And often we will get to the 
you know, be, be in an episode and be like, oh man, here's a subset of this topic that could be its own, you know, in a episode 115 with biomes, we would mention different biomes and be like, oh yeah, no, forests could be their own episode. Deserts could be their own episode. This is a case where we get to say, hey, coprolites uh, could be their own episode. And they are. And in fact, episode 30, uh, evidence of parasitism in the fossil record, including trace fossils. Episode 102, evidence of behavior in the fossil record we discussed back in episode 61, including lots of trace fossil examples. We've done a bunch of this stuff. So if you want to dive more into it and you haven't listened to those episodes, or if you haven't listened to those episodes in a bit, (laughs) you can check them out. One more thing that I do want to mention that I I think is important to note while on the subject of looking at specific organisms in Earth history is the trace fossil record of us. Us? Some of the most famous trace fossil, like individual trace fossils in the world, come from Laetoli in Tanzania, the famous fossil footprint site, which is famous specifically for its hominid tracks. Preserved in volcanic ash, about three and a half million years old, very importantly, some of the earliest evidence of bipedal locomotion in hominins, in our lineage. Our understanding of our own lineage is strongly tethered to some trace fossils. Those uh, hominin footprints have even been used in kinematic studies to understand how were we walking when we, I say we, you know, how were our ancestors walking as they made these footprints? What might their legs have been structured like? How did they move? A crucial piece of our own history. Laetoli is actually a super cool site because it not only preserves hominin tracks, but also tracks of all the other stuff that live there. Mm -hmm. So hyenas, saber-toothed cats, elephants, rhinos, giraffes, antelopes, uh, camels, I think, and more. There are even raindrop prints in the preserved ash at Laetoli. Wow. Which are, of course, not trace fossils because they're rain. But how cool is that? But that's just... That's, that's like tsunami ripples. Yeah, that's that's just... <laughs> that, in my brain, that's just beautiful. Right? <laughs> and, and it is. Yeah. Wow. And then, of course, getting uh, nearer to the present and getting to those blurry edges of the discipline, there is a term that I came across, ichnoarchaeology. Which makes sense. Ichnology as applied to archaeological studies. Archaeology, of course, being the study of human cultures and communities and civilizations through time. I found a reference talking about it that straight up said there is no sharp limit between ichnology and archaeology. Yeah. Because there are some things that are kind of both. There's human traces, right? Like those footprints. Human footprints have been found on every continent except Antarctica. We've got lots of examples. There's coprolites. We've talked about examples of archaeological sites being investigated, you know, investigations of poop to see what people were eating. There are, of course, tool marks Mm -hmm. going all the way back to the beginning of the episode with our stabbed bear. Yup. Signs of butchery and hunting that humans made marks on bones. Uh, Modification of bones can be uh, arguably included in ichnology when we are modifying bones to make tools or to make artwork. Uh, That reference that I looked at even mentioned surgery. (laughs) Signs of early surgery on bones. Yeah, we're leaving traces on the bones could arguably fall under ichnology. But then on the other hand, archaeological sites have also been used as sources of ichnological information because trace fossils can often be left in artificial substrates. Mm -hmm. There are, at medieval sites, there are places where there are footprints in the bricks of the buildings (laughs) that have been used to identify local wildlife. Uh, Bivalve borings in the material of ancient buildings can provide information about sea levels. (laughs) (laughs) Because as the ocean comes up to meet these buildings, bivalves are digging into the the, the walls. Uh, there are, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, there are fossil burrows from the early Paleozoic in the limestone 
that was used to construct the front steps of the geology building on East Tennessee State University campus right next to us. Yep. So you can get this cool information from, like, there are trace fossils in the stuff we have in our structures and buildings. Which is a pretty awesome concept that (laughs) now the substrate are artifacts that we've left behind. And therein lies that sort of blurry edge of the discipline, as as is always the case. Ichnology meets archaeology in those kinds of cases where it's human traces, where it's traces in buildings. Ichnology meets body fossilology, which I don't actually know if that has a term. Yeah. In yeah. cases where you can find a coprolite with uh, bugs in it Mm -hmm. or you can find an egg with an embryo in it or you can find the horseshoe crab that died at the end of its own trackway we get these intersections where ichnology and i I think that it really does demonstrate the the way that trace fossils are not actually a separate discipline yeah they are a specific discipline and they are a specific type of fossil and ichnology is a particular branch of natural sciences but there's no they're they're not even i i hesitate to even describe them as like boxes with blurry edges they're like it's a bush i was gonna say it's interwoven it's like an aspen tree yeah just just throughout all these other topics and concepts and studies uh well in the the line of there is no distinct barrier between ichnology and archaeology the first thought that came to my mind is way back at the beginning when you're going through the different terms for different kinds of trace mm-hmm. fossils. One of them included nests, you know, like yep. built nests, structures that are built, not just like I dug out a nest, but I put something yeah, together. Like a, like a beehive. Like a beehive. Why does a house not count Yeah, as one of those? <laughs> what what if not a nest <laughs> is a yeah, house? A dwelling. So like, that's a, that's a domicnia. That seems like a really big trace fall. It's kind of like the argument between should we call it ne- a necropsy or an autopsy? It's, it's the same thing. <laughs> well, we it, just use a different one for humans a lot of the time. We, we've talked about the where paleoanthropology mm-hmm. grades into uh, paleontology. You know, paleontology and archaeology have a blurry line between them. Uh, artificial and natural. Yep. That really, your example makes me think. Yep. Uh, yeah, is a, is a house not of nature? Well, there's a there's a, a Joe Rogan, I think, stand up about how the fact that cities are natural, because if they weren't, there'd only be one of them. They wouldn't be everywhere. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, it's not like there's just one weird one that we're all freaked out by. It's like they happened naturally because they happened all every, everywhere people are. So trace fossils, this is another one of those episodes where, like, we've dipped our toe into what is a vast uh, subject that will continue to come up over the course of the podcast and has. Like I said, if you want to learn a, a bunch about particular types of trace fossils and particular applications of trace fossils, listen to the Common Descent podcast. Yep. Uh, the other 117 episodes are full of great examples of ichnology. I mean, anytime we talk about an organism especially a plant or animal there's going to be a high chance that there's a trace fossil for the group we're talking about oh yeah leaves leave imprints and they leave footprints and this thing might bite something so anytime we talk about a group of life there's probably going to be a chance for a trace fossil to pop in there this actually uh this puts you dear listeners in a position that we uh dear hosts are not in i realize as i say this that you, I, I would hope, I would, I, I, I it is, it is uh, my hope that an episode like this can alter the perspective of listening to older discussions that we've had. Mm-hmm. That you can now go through an older episode with a mind of how we understand trace fossils. And, you know, when you hear us mention trace fossils, because in future episodes, I will now be thinking about this. Oh, yes. Whenever we mention trace fossils, I'm going to be like, oh, all this stuff I know about trace fossils. But I don't listen to my podcast. (laughs) Well, technically, we could be in your shoes. We choose not to be. But we're not. (laughs) So if you are one of those uh, wacky folk who listen to our podcast over and over again. Which we appreciate so much, but are always baffled by. Very, uh, just keep doing it. It's Fantastic. awesome, but wow. That's, that's, uh, it's not like we don't have things we do that with. No, yeah, it's we do that with other stuff, but not it's this us. podcast. Yeah, why that's would, weird. Why would you listen to us that much? Yo, weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it, it, it would be so cool if like 
each time there's new perspective because we've done an episode like this that cha- this is what this is i'm gonna stop in a second this is a rare episode <laughs> that really does tie in to many of our other episodes yes we have discussed this topic a lot without a- it's like our climate episode 113 that ties into a lot of previous discussions and so this has been exciting for me i i hope you can tell hey you know what else is exciting we have a Patreon. Hey! And on our Patreon, if you become a Patreon, we will give you extra goodies. And one of those goodies is you can ask questions for us to answer here on the podcast. We happen to have a patron question to cap off this episode. Will, would you please, I have t- I have spoken so much, read this patron question. Happily, our question comes from Sam, who asks... How can you estimate the lifespan of animals from the fossil record? Oh, now this is a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, we can do that. Uh, I, this is a, one of those uh, cases where I feel it is important to say, usually we can't. Yes. Most fossils don't preserve that kind of evidence. But we can estimate the age of an individual fossil organism. Uh, when it comes to mammals, we use teeth. Yep. Uh, at the gray fossil site, I may have given this example before, the complete mastodon skeleton we have has fresh, un, almost unused wisdom teeth, which suggest it just got them. Uh, and based on modern elephants, we have a sense of how old proboscideans tend to be when they get their wisdom teeth. Uh, so we can say, yeah, that specific animal was probably 30 years old or so. In reptilian, like dinosaurs, uh, often we're using growth lines in the bone. So as dinosaurs grow, their bones are creating sort of like tree rings. It's very similar concept, tree rings. So you can get a sense of how many years they were alive. Also fossil trees. Yep. You can get a sense of how many years they were alive. This also applies to a lot of other reptile groups like crocs and stuff have a similar growth pattern. And so, yeah, you can definitely get a sense of growth patterns. You may not always be able to get a, like, we can often get an idea of, what stage of a life Mm -hmm. an animal might be in like this is definitely an old individual we're seeing signs of arthritis or like worn down teeth or a lot of times uh, animals that are well known in the fossil record will be given growth like numbered growth stages yes so our friend julia published a paper on the gray fossil site tapers not long ago and it pointed out that some i don't they, they didn't do this somebody else i think they were using another model from a previous research that had identified stages in taper teeth over the course of their life so you can say yeah this taper is in stage eight and in modern tapers that's you know six years old or whatever yeah. and so we can often if you have enough of the the fossils of that organism to have a lifespan you know babies to old individuals you can often break it down you might not always be able to get down to the year of age if you don't have a comparison. Right. Uh, so we might be able to say, this is an old sauropod, but we don't have anything that grows for sure, so we might not be able to say it is this many years old. Right. We might be able to say mature. Yes. Uh, you can also find growth lines in shells and corals, lots of invertebrates. Now, lifespan is an interesting term to use, because when I hear lifespan, I think expected lifespan. Yes. Like the lifespan of a, of humans is 80 years or whatever. And in that regard, that is much harder to mm-hmm. know from the fossil record in part because lifespan is influenced by so many things. Like the lifespan of most animals in nature is much shorter than their possible lifespan. Yep. Uh, and this has been discussed, uh, I think we may have mentioned this before, but it is very a commonly cited uh, observation of the dinosaur fossil record that most of our dinosaur fossils are not fully grown mm-hmm. because they die before they reach adult age and become fossilized. So if you wanted to get like an expected lifespan from a fossil creature, you would need a community with lots of them that are able to be aged. Yep. And so, then you can start working out the average. For example, I I would be very interested to see if we could do that for the tapers at the Gray Fossil site. Ooh, yes. Because Julia and Josh aged them based on their teeth. And we have tons of, I think we've got like 70 something skulls. So if we can age all of those skulls based on their teeth, we can get an idea maybe of average expected, like life expectancy. Mm-hmm. 
for them, which would be pretty cool. I don't know of any fossil animal off the top of my head for which it has been determined a an expected lifespan. Well, and it, it, except maybe like ancient humans. Yeah, and and that's what you said about the average lifespan versus possible is really where I think it gets messy because the human's expected lifespan is like, you know, 70s to 80s. Uh, but we know that the possible is like 100 and, I don't know, whatever, like 108 or something like that, I think, mm-hmm. is the one of the records. Uh, but topping out within the first decade o- over 100 is how old we can get as far as we've seen. But also that expected age of 80 is not what it was. Right. That's what it is today with medicine and surgery and diet awareness. Yeah. And that's not even a, a thing that just happens to humans. Once again, to go back to tapers, our friend Laura uh, did a study several years ago of comparing tapers from the Gray Fossil Site to tapers from a site in Florida and found that at the Gray Fossil Site, tapers seem to have been getting older mm-hmm. more often. Hmm? For whatever difference there was in the ecosystem, fewer predators or whatever, yeah, the the expect the life expectancy of a taper at our site may very well have been different from the life expectancy at another site. Well, and I think the most telling of that is that it is painfully, blatantly obvious with most animals, not all, there are definitely some that don't show this, and it's usually due to complications, but when you take a wild animal and a animal in human care in in captivity at a zoo or aquarium the lifespan often close to doubles yes like the one i would often talk about because it would come up because they're big so people want to know how old does an alligator get so well out in the their natural habitat you know 30 to 50 is an old alligator sure in a zoo or an aquarium yeah 60 to 80 can happen pretty easily they basically have the same lifespan as a human with and without medicine and regular food. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's There's a reason why 30 was old back in the olden days for us. It happens if your situation improves, your lifespan ex- expands. And so it's hard to determine. Yeah. Intriguing question. Thank you very much, Sam, for your question and for your support. And thank you to all of our patrons for their support, past, present, and future. Eh? Thank you to all of our listeners. Hey, even if you aren't a patron, even if you can't be a patron, we get it. We, yeah. We're surprised we have as many patrons as we do. That Thank you to everybody. We're, we are as, we're surprised that people like our podcast so much. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. The fact that people are still listening is, is baffling and fantastic. And we got to keep doing it. Oh, <laughs> goodness. Thank you to everyone who has listened to this episode and who has listened to any other episodes. We'll do more episodes. There'll be more episodes coming up. Hey, uh, if you like us, uh, check out our other content. We do extra stuff. We are on YouTube. We are on iTunes. We are in all the places. Hey, we're also on another podcast that our friend Josh is doing, Mysteries of the Mornland. Listen to us play Advanced 5th Edition. Hey, also, we're going to be at Dragon Con uh, here at the beginning of September, so stay tuned for more information about that. Hey, after that, it'll be October, and we'll do Spooky. That's a fun thing we do. We do a lot of stuff. (laughs) Busy, 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 busy. We also have a blog where we put blog episodes after every episode with blog posts after every other more links and images and stuff. If you want to learn more things, <laughs> you know what else we do? We release episodes every fortnight. <laughs> so stay tuned and there will be more episodes coming up. You know what else we do is we ramble our way to the, the outro. As is tradition. Mm. It's a, it's I, really late. A long running tradition at this point. Yeah, it is. That's it's, it's one of our staples. Yep, and it's it's I uh, I forget how long it's been running. Sometimes it has it it has <laughs> it has. You know what else has been running long? This, this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, yours was a lot nicer. <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, thanks for listening. We're gonna sign out now. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon.
The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.